Back when I was 16 years old, I was uh, on a trip with my brother and an uncle, <clears throat> and we were in Paris. I was in Paris for the first time. And I was looking down <clears throat> as I was walking. It was winter, and I was looking down. I was shivering, I remember. And so my, I remember very clearly that my uncle had to tell me, not once, but a couple of times, Look up, chins up, you're in Paris. You may never come back here again. Look up, see this wonderful history on the architecture in the, in, in the middle of the city. Look how glorious the city is. This might be your last time here. Maybe you can never return to Paris. I was totally missing the beauty and um, looking just for the next step. After that, I made a point of looking up, right, to see how glorious this city was. And in fact, that's, that's, that's how it is. And I, I never went back. So it was, it was a good thing. Now, for the entire month of November, the church invite us, invites us to do the same thing. Look up to the heights, to heaven, to the glory that is ours. We have to see that glory. Now, granted, this is not so easy always. But in the month of November, we start with all saints. So we celebrate all the saints that there ever were and uh, got to heaven. And we have some saints here that are going to stump the priest in a little bit after Mass. We, we celebrate also all souls, so we pray for everyone who has gone before us. We pray for all those whom no one prays for, for the forgotten ones. We pray for our loved ones. We pray for past generations, all the faithful departed. What a comfort it is to celebrate this feast and this month. When I'm gone, Someone will pray at least once a year for me. <laughs> that's what we're making sure that we do here in the church. And that's a great comfort. We won't be forgive, forgiven. And this is the time of the year then to look up to heaven, to raise our heads and contemplate through the veil of this world another world that lies behind it, that is side to side to this visible, material world. Not because we don't see it, it doesn't exist. Not because we don't see the saints, they don't affect us. Not because we don't see the angels, they do not surround this altar at this very moment. So there is a spiritual world. St. Paul says, we look not to what is seen, but to what is unseen. For what is seen is transitory, but what is unseen is eternal. Now, granted that we, in this world, sometimes it's hard for us to look up to and desire heaven because we don't see it, and we have so many different desires. We, we know some desires are good desires, and some desires are not so good, right? There are even bad desires that we have. So... Sometimes we have a desire to um, take a revenge or a desire to procrastinate in school, not to do our homework. I'm sure that doesn't happen to any of the kids here. Or we have the desire to disobey, for instance, our parents, or disobey the law, the grown-ups. We have desires that we, we know that they are not good, but that we, at the same time, acknowledge that we do have them, that they are just there. But some, at the same time, we have other sort, sort of desires that are very good desires and that are, are very hard to quench. For, for example, the desire of being joyful, or of being happy. 
for true and lasting relationships. We all desire that. And so sometimes we even f have fear that we will lose our friendships. And we worry about that and we stress out. Also, we have a great desire for peace and for security that sometimes translates only into financial security. But really what we want is just to be at peace profound peace for contentment. We also have the students and, uh, well, everybody, we have a desire to know things. We all have this desire, and, and the more you know, the more you want to know. And so we find that these desires are in us, but we can never satisfy them totally. So we find that these desires follow two patterns. The first one is that they are given, received. They, we, we didn't make them up. We just grew up with them. We were born with them. We were, they were given, put into our hearts by God himself when he created us. And the second pattern is that they are pretty much unquenchable. And so they are a little bit rebellious. We are always a little bit discontent because we never totally satisfy them. They are unpeaceable. And so we start to see that there's got to be more. There's got to be a place where we actually come to, all those desires come to fruition. They, they are fulfilled. Because when, when we have a desire, we have something to satisfy that desire in general. Like we are thirsty. So what do we do? We drink water. And there is water to quench our thirst. We are hungry, and so we have burgers. <laughs> Something to satisfy not only our hunger, but ah, the taste in the mouth, and you know that. And we are tired, and we, we can rest, right? And, and so for each desire, there is something that satisfies, fits right into that desire. What happened with these desires of peace, lasting relationships and, and, and real love, the desire for truth and knowledge, well, all of them will be fulfilled, but not here. That's what we believe. And Jesus says exactly this. Yes, in, the life, in, the, in heaven, that's where all our greatest desires will come to fruition. And that's a great thing because we can long for our homeland. Have you ever been homesick? Have you ever been abroad? And maybe everything is right in the trip. The food is just fine. The place is gorgeous. But you've just been away from home too much, too long. You like everything yet that you're seeing, but you're just ready to come home. Well, that's exactly the longing that we have. Sort of this desire for just go back home. And so we're always a little bit homesick on this earth. This, because our true home is in heaven, right? <clears throat> now, Jesus says today in the gospel that we are going to this home, yeah? And he says, everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. When he says this, he mean, means this fulfillment of all these desires. And I will raise him up at the last day. So it's not only the desires, but that we will be raised up in heaven. This is something that is very important, and we have hardly ever talked about this, that we will be raised at the last day. I remember when I was in, when I find out about this, I went to Catholic school all my life, I was 18 was so upset. How can no one ever talk to me about the resurrection of the dead? And I started to think, maybe I didn't pay attention to my teacher in religious ed. <laughs> maybe I didn't pay attention to the creed that we recite every Sunday at Mass. Anyway, so we know that we will be raised up. Jesus will raise us up. And this is something very difficult to grasp with. Because it sounds kind of abstract. How is it that we're going to be raised in the last day? 
Well, I'd like to share a little story from C.S. Lewis' book called The Great Divorce. And this is a story for children. Are you ready? Okay. So it's this story will set up the, the it happens in purgatory, but purgatory is not a, a, a dreadful place as we think sometimes. It's just grassy fields, right? But the people who are there, they don't look, they don't have strong bodies. So they look more like, like uh, phantoms or ghosts. And there's this guy who shows up with a lizard, a red lizard in his shoulder that talks to him. And this lizard is a little bit toxic, right? So an angel who is made out of bright light and fire comes to him. It's great, the description of Louis. And he comes up to, to this person and he tells, do you want to get rid of the lizard? I, can, I, could, I, could, um, I could do that for you. And he says, well, I'm not so sure. So he starts to reach out to him with these hands of fire. Right? And as he approaches, he says, well, I don't know. Are you going to kill him? Well, yes, but I don't know. We were not talking about that. So he, this great conversation happens in between them. And the lizard says to him very quietly, be careful, he can kill me. He can really get rid of me. Do you want to live without me? The lizard, it's never quiet in this conversation. And the ghost, or this ghosty figure, finally accepts. Okay, go ahead, do what you have to do. And the angel reaches out and grabs the lizard who struggles and he throws him into the grass. And then the narrator says that he doesn't see very clearly because he's hiding behind the bush. And then all of a sudden he sees that this ghost starts to grow and to have a real body. He becomes a huge man, very strong and healthy. But also he notices that the lizard who's on the, on the floor and it's kind of a a uh, piece of coal with, with fire starts to struggle and shakes and all of a sudden starts to grow as well and becomes this great horse with a great and shiny um, tail. So it's this great transformation that happens. And it's only an image that Louis uses but it's so great. And then I would like to say the following. The lizard becomes this, 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 this great um, horse and then the man who's purified and the lizard who signifies his unruly desires which are only also um, purified. They ride together and they go to the mountains whereas in this image that Lewis uses, heaven. So let me share this little piece of text of the, the final story, like the grand finale of this story. It says the following, Lewis. The new man, made man, turned and clapped the new horse's neck. It nosed his bright body. Horse and master breathed each into the other's nostrils. The man turned from him, flung himself at the feet of the burning one, the angel, and embraced them. When he rose, I thought his face shone with tears, but it may have been only the liquid love and brightness. One cannot distinguish them in that country, which knocked the stallion with it, which flowed from him. I had not long to think about it. Turning in his seat, he waved a farewell, farewell. Then, knocked the stallion with his heels. They were off before I knew well what was happening. They were riding, if you like. I came out, out as quickly as I could from among the bushes to follow them with my eyes. But already, they were only like a shooting star far off on the green plain. And soon 
among the foothills of the mountains. He's climbing up to heaven. Then, still like a star, I saw them winding up, scaling what seemed impossible steeps, and quicker every moment, till near the dim brow of the landscape, so high that I must strain my neck to see them, they vanished, bright themselves, into the rose brightness of that everlasting morning. What a beautiful image it is. This new man, fully, fully a man now, riding in this horse, which is all these desires purified through fire. That's what we say about precisely the purgatory. Not a suppression of our desires, but a transformation, bringing about the best of us and putting even the energy that we lose in sinning to the service of God. Our bodies transformed, glorified, shining, brilliant, made new. But also our souls, our desires, transformed and made new. This is the hope of glory. This is the hope of glory, an image of that hope. Not one that passes away, like the beauty in Paris. One in which all desires will be purified and made new. An everlasting one, an everlasting glory with a risen one.